Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thus far, I hope that your day has been enjoyable. I want to thank all that have participated to make this special occasion possible. Today, our theme is Historically Black Colleges and Universities, HBCUs. If any of you, and I'm sure there are a few of you that have been a product of an HBCU, if you would, just stand up right now and give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Something about that one on that side over there. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Gail P. Hall. I am a product of two HBCUs. The first, Prairie View A&M University, where Prairie View produces productive people. And Texas Southern University, yes. where there is excellence in achievement. Currently, I serve on the faculty in the School of Communication at Texas Southern University. My cohort and partner in crime, my daughter, Dr. Coyette Gaston Morton also serves on the faculty in the history department at Prairie View A&M University. So HBCUs do a lot for us. Yes. In searching our family heirlooms, I discovered my father's degree from the Texas State University for Negroes. He graduated and he was one of the first to graduate from the Texas State University for Negroes. Preston Avius Adams. <laughs> I know that my father would be proud to see how far his school has progressed. My brothers and sisters, we have come a long way in the words of Dr. Coyette Gaston Morton, she wrote, and this was published in a journal. If you give me just a moment, I want to read an excerpt from her words. Black History Month provides a unique period in which black Americans are told how integral black American contributions have been to the success of the United States. Black history, as presented through the mainstream, retains a strong focus on the first. The first black person to achieve this or the first black person to accomplish that, highlighting the challenges that black Americans have overcome rather than how the black American collective has challenged the United States. From the trove of documentaries, historical fiction and media advertised during this month, the month of February, one would assume that the American public is receiving adequate instruction concerning the black experience in the United States. However, it's found that the problem is from whose perspective history is told rather than the frequency of recognition. Essentially, it is more palatable for America to remember choice phrases from Dr. Martin Luther King's Jr. I have a dream speech rather than his critique of white Christian and moderate complacency in the letter from Birmingham jail. This Black History Month, we should argue that we should not view the black experience in the United States as an uphill battle from slavery to freedom, but embrace the black experience in the United States as an American demonstration of humility, grace, forgiveness, and resistance. Thank you, Dr. Gaston. So my fellow black Americans, it's time for us to take charge of our narratives, tell our own stories, interpret their meanings, and determine our own destinies. Today, as we revisit our past, let's revel in the tenacity that our forefathers and mothers possessed and try to duplicate their accomplishments and resilience. I welcome you to the 2023 Carverdale Black History Program 
Enjoy the history, the poetry, the dramatic interpretations, the music, and the legacy of love that will be presented today. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we are going to have um, I Too Sing America by Langston Hughes performed by our Cheryl Carrillo Jr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Arturo Carrillo, and I'm here today going to be talking about the poem, I Too, by Langston Hughes. I Too Sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Then, besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. Samaria. Um, I'll be reciting uh, the poem Human Family by Maya Angelou. Uh, I know the obvious, is, obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare the lives lived as true profundity. And others claim they really live the real reality. The ver variety of our skin tones can confuse Bemused, delight, brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not, I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mary twins are different, although their features jive and others and lovers think quite different thoughts, while others are lying side by side. We love and lose in China, 
We weep on Eagleland moors and laugh and moan in Ginwan and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways, we differ in major ways the same. I note the obvious differences between each s sort and type, but we, but we are more like my friends than we are unlike. We are more like my friends than we are unlike. We are more like my friends than we are unlike. <laughs> My name is Seth, as y'all all know, and I'll be reading the, the poem by Langston Hughes, uh, Dream Deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sand? like a raisin in the sun, or faster like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust over like a syrupy sweet, or maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Hey, black child, by Yusene Eugene Perkins. Hey, black child, do you know who you are? Who you really are? Do you know what you, do you, know you can be what you want to be if you try to be what you can be? Hey, black child, do you know where you're going? Where you're really going? Do you know you can learn what you want to learn if you try to learn what you can learn? Hey, black child, do you know you are strong? I mean, really strong. Do you know you can be what you want to be if you try to be what you can be? Hey, black child. Be what you can be. Learn what you must learn. Do what you can do. And tomorrow your nation will be what you want it to be. Welcome to Black History Month! Yay! I have a dream! Let's go to the box! Thanks, MLK, because of your courage, 
see now a chance to go to school and college we white people. But before then, we had to create our own college. Hey, what's an HBCU? An HBCU? You really don't know what that is? Um, no. I was thinking you could tell me. What is an HBCU? 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 An HBCU is a college, a university. It's where black folks can go to school to get a degree. Before the Civil War, we couldn't go to school with whites. But they didn't want us there, so we fought hard for our rights. In 1837, this how it happened. The first HBCU emerged and things got cracking. Cheney University was the very first school. And now we have so many, and I think it's really cool. There's 107 in the U.S. alone, but nine in Texas, so we got it going on. The school of black college and universities were made so that we blacks can go and get degrees. What is an HBCU? 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 Okay, so the HBCU was made so blacks could get degrees? Yes, of course. Remember whites didn't want us in their schools? Wow, there's nine in Texas? Can you show me some? Yep, I'll show you too. You can be anything you want to be. Here are two HBCUs that can get you there. You can get there from here.
I will say this. I'm kind of glad that um, you kind of got on the ceremony between the young, gifted, and black. So if you got some before me and some after me, so I must be that I'm young, gifted, and black as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that. Today, as was mentioned in the video you just saw, there are over 100 HBCUs in the United States. These, are, these statistics are probably a couple years old. Uh, they've confirmed more than 48,000 degrees. Oh, I got to stay up. Sorry. I like to move around. Um, some people I've listed that have graduated from HBCUs, Oprah Winfrey, I'm going to come back to the first one in a minute. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who went to graduate from Morehouse College. Thurgood Marshall from Lincoln University. Michael Strahan, Texas Southern, football champion. Y'all know who Two Chains are, is? Well, the young kids know him as Two Chains. The rest of y'all don't know. But he went to Alabama State. And Wanda Sykes, who was a comedian, who went to Hampton University. Now, also, our vice president. It's not pronounced Kamala Harris. It's pronounced Kamala. Just FYI. And she went to uh, Howard University. Now, in the Bible, Paul wrote letters to uh, church. And one of the first things he said was, I would not have you ignorant. Well, I'm going to do the same thing for you. Let's understand something. The concept of a black university is not new to the United States. In Africa, there are schools which trace history back before HBCUs in the United States were even thought of. The University of Timbuktu was founded in 987 CE, which stands for Common Era. It's located in the, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's actually located in the area that's called Mali. I don't know if you can see that or not, so I apologize, I don't have my pointer. The second school, University of al Khartoum, is located in the area of Morocco. And as you could see, it traces its roots back to 959 AD. The next school is pronounced Al-Hazar, which is located in the area of Egypt back in 972 AD. Fura Bay College in 18, I can't see that, 1827, which is located in the Sierra Leone area, era, and finally University of Cape Town in 1829, which is located in South Africa. Once again, the concept of historically black college university is not new to the United States. We have origin to go all, all the way back to the motherland where we originated. Now, we know how we got here to the United States. Our ancestors came over on slave ships. And we were brought for a specific purpose to work on the tobacco plantations, the cotton plantations, the sugar plantations, the rice plantations, and cotton, I don't know if I mentioned it or not. Now, the primary driver was an economic one, okay? I know we've seen the stories of how we were treated, but the primary purpose was economic. What do I mean by that? Blacks from West Africa were a cheap labor source. It's just like you all going to your jobs, you work, you don't get paid, but the business takes all the profit. Now, if you think about that, a situation such as that is really nice if you're the owner. A situation like that is worth protecting. Because if you think about it, when you have something good, one of the first things that you think about is the fear of losing it. Well, if fear does a lot of things, there's an element to fear which sort of uh, dictates survival. And what that means is you're going to come up with a way to try to preserve your way of life for fear of losing it. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay. Just like, now you think about it like this. I don't know if any of you had an, a, a job where you got paid by the hour, right? Well, if your hours were, if you were short an hour or two, you had a problem. I want you to understand something. The economic impact of slavery in the, what we call the South. 
by, by the year 1860, there were more millionaires living in the lower Mississippi Delta than anywhere in the country. Think about that. In, that, in the Mississippi Delta area, where I believe Brother Misio is from, well, maybe somewhere near there, they had more millionaires than in the United States. There were some, there's some estimates as far as there were about four million slaves. They had an economic value of about $3.5 billion, which at that time was more than any asset anywhere. Finally, 75%, this is by 1860, 75% of the world's cotton, not the United States, but 75% of the cotton that was produced in the world came from the South. So naturally, there is an economic and a financial benefit to these slave owners having only these people generating all these profits, getting all this money, and not have to pay for anything. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to paint the picture that you understand that, hey, the way of, that way of life was worth them protecting. Heck, they went, to, they went to a war over that to preserve their way of life. Now, um, the idea is if you, if you know there's a threat coming, then you have to be smart enough to try to deal with that threat before it becomes one. Okay? Now, I have a quote here from a fam I have two quotes here. The one from a very famous Prussian general. And Brother Quiller, can you make that a little bigger? Because I can't even, nope. OK, so I'm going to have to step off for just a second. So uh, the guy named was Carl Van Hoffman, he was a German, he was Prussian. And he wrote a book called On War. And it talks about how to conquer a particular people. And his quote in his book says, the key to attack, and to, the key is to attack and control the mind. You must shape the way people view life and the values on which it was based. Now, we know the story between about us getting whipped and stuff like that. Well, understand something. The whip only goes so far as far as getting people to comply. Well, the real battle or the real thing they had to con conquer was the mind. How do you control the mind? Well, you have to control what goes into the mind. So as a result, there were a couple of things they did. The first thing they did was they kept, they prohibited blacks from reading. So for all you young people, when your parents are trying to get you to read, there's a reason for that. That is the gateway or that's the pathway to intelligence. Thank you, brother. Thank you. The, other, the other avenue that they, uh, that they went down was a spiritual one. Many of your slave owners and their men of God would always refer to Ephesians 6, 5. And Ephesians 6, 5, and I'm paraphrasing, talks about how servants obey your masters, so on and so forth. So they would have sermons, or whatever the case may be, to where they would preach that particular, they would talk about that particular uh, scripture. Now, we as members of the church, we always taught, just like the Bereans, how they were able to verify or how we rightly divide the word of truth. Well, I got a question for you. How could you rightly divide anything if you can't read? All you can do is go by what somebody told. Okay? Now, I also make a reference to something called the Slave Bible. I don't know if any of you are really familiar with it. But anyway, but back in the, they had slave owners that were trying to take over the, the British West Indies or whatever the case may be. And the Slave Bible was where they took the actual Bible and took parts out. Most of the Old Testament was not in there. The part that was in there, when, we, when uh, Joseph and the uh, Israelites became slave, they kept that part in. They took out the part when Moses came and brought them out of Egypt. So you got two things going on, because like I said, we're spiritual people. Not only did they prohibit us from reading or learning, or even writing for that matter, they also attacked us from a spiritual standpoint. We didn't know any better, so therefore we had to go along. So it wasn't just the whip that kept us compliant, ladies and gentlemen. It was to control the information that we had in our minds. Because we had no other way of putting anything in there to the contrary. Now, 
they were afraid of that because now if you have these people learning things, what's going to happen? Well, one of the slave owners kind of summed it up right here. I'll mean, put, put what he said. He said, talk about this slave. He should know nothing but the will of his master and learn to obey. As to himself, learning will do him no good but a great deal of harm, making him disolate. And I know I'm mispronouncing that. Bear with me. And I'm happy. If you teach him how to read, he'll want to know how to write. And as a accomplished, he'll be running away with himself. That biggest fear was realized in the revolt of 1831 with Nat Turner, who happened to be an educated minister at that time. I won't go into all that, but there's a story. So now, as a result of that, they said, wait a minute. I can't necessarily keep these people compliant by telling them that they can't read. I need to put something on the books. There were several states in the, in the South that actually put on the books actually what, we, what I call anti-literacy laws. So it made it punishable by crime not only for you to, for someone who was black to read, but also anyone who was teaching them how to read, it would be, excuse me, punishable as well. Now I won't insult you and tell you about trying to read it, but just understand, not only uh, there were legal things that prohibited us from yeah. reading. Let y'all look at that for a second. And I'm gonna show us Alabama and Georgia because I lived in both those states before. But. So when, we, when you talk about why or what was the purpose of HBCUs starting, well, there's a lot of things, but it's probably more so a direct result of anti-literacy laws that prohibited us from doing certain things. Now, I want to I want to talk about something. Now, the schools that we the HBCUs as we recognize them today have these advanced programs in engineering, science, uh, math, and all that kind of stuff. But the very first ones when they started had to start with the basics. Think about it. You have this huge amount of people, right, who couldn't read it or write. So before you start talking about differential equations and algebra and things of that nature, you had to learn the basics. So you're talking about people 19, 20, however old they were, learning the basics. So understand, that's kind of where we had to start somewhere. That's where we had to start. Now, the second thing that, that popped to your mind, well, okay, when? Well, my nephews and great nephews have already mentioned when they started. Is a natural assumption to believe or think that HBCU started after the Civil War or after Emancipation Proclamation? No. There were four, and I'll mention them in a few moments, that actually started before. Now, I will say this. The root for most of these were in, in the North because as I already told you, and as you already know, in the South, it was prohibited to do pretty much anything. So a lot of these, the seed for a lot of these schools, or four of these schools that I'm going to mention, actually started in the north. The first one, it was called the Institute for Colored Youth. Could you imagine having a t-shirt with that on? <laughs> you know, you all representing your school and all that, but Institute of Colored Youth. <laughs> started in 1937 up in Philadelphia. Um, it was, and actually, this, the route was started by a black man named Richard Humphreys. Now, Richard Humphreys was born in, um, uh, he was born in the British Virgin Islands. So he and his brother came to Philadelphia. They were actually apprentice or, or silversmiths, I, I guess that's the way to refer to them. Now, so they, they already came over here educated. They already came over here with a skill, with a trade, with a business. But during their time there, they were able to witness the struggle of, even in the North, black people who were not able to actually get a job and, and understand there's something else that goes on at that particular time. Well, between 1930 and 1950, the United States saw the, the influx of a lot of immigrants, primarily from Europe and places like that. Well, you think about this for a second. You've got a labor pool of white affluent people who already knew certain things. You had another influx of, of people 
who were from Europe, Europe who were educated, that knew things. Well, who do you think got left out of the job market? Hmm. You think it's hard to compete for a job now. What if you don't have any skills whatsoever? So as, a civil, as, he, as he went on and he witnessed this particular struggle, um, when he died, he left in his will $10,000. I don't know what that is in days, but $10,000 is 10 grand. So uh, he was part of a Quaker group. So uh, in his will, and these are the words directly from his will, it said um, to, to instruct the descendants of the African race in school learning, in the various branches of the mechanic arts, trades, and agriculture, in order to prepare and fit and qualify them to act as teachers. Teaching is probably one of the first professions that we as blacks were able to do. Because we had to learn how to do certain things, but we in, a, in turn, not only that, we had to learn to teach our people as well. So for all you teachers, kudos to you. That's just, that's just an aside. That university has changed its name. It's now known as Cheney University. So if you, you won't see, if you Google, I don't think you'll see any t-shirts called the Institute for Colored Youth. It's actually Cheney University. But if you want a t-shirt, I'm sure we can probably make one for you. <laughs> the next school started in 1951, and it had an even more specific name. Normal School for Colored Girls. <laughs> so as I'm looking down this audience, I could see quite a few of y'all that would have been in there, I think. <laughs> Just FYI. Martilla Miller, she was the one that started. Now, by trade and by profession, she was a teacher. So you think about you have a, once again, I told you how important teaching was, a teacher actually being instrumental in starting a school. Well, as a teacher who was educated in Rochester, New York, she, had, she taught had different teaching assignments. Well, she found herself in Mississippi. I'm not sure why she found her way down there. Don't know. But she did. Well, being from the North, she wanted to teach some colored girls. Well, in the South, that wasn't going to happen. So she, ref she was refused to do so, but also they sort of ran out of town. We don't do that kind of thing down in these parts. So. Uh, she moved back north, up north, and then she began her plight to try to raise, was like, look, I'm going to have to do something, so I'm going to try to raise money to start a school for colored girls, colored women. She, a couple of people that she got donations from, and I list them here, one was Frederick Douglass. Uh, the way the story goes, when she first tried to pitch the idea to him, he wasn't really on board with it. But I guess after prodding, whatever the case may be, I think the amount he gave her was about $1,000. And also, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harold Beecher Stowe, also gave a donation to her as well. And she started now. Here's the other thing that's kind of very interesting. She started a school in D.C. Now, the thing that's so interesting about that is, at the time, slave trade was illegal in D.C., Slavery was still legal. Let me say that again. Slavery was still legal, but slave trade was not. So you think about the backlash or of her trying to start a school for colored girls in a place where slavery was still legal. Still was able to do it. And I believe the way the story goes, I think she started in a frame house and she started with maybe six students. The next school, it's called Ashman Institute. Now, Ashman um, was named from a, uh, there was a 18th century um, social reformist. His name was Jedediah Ashman. I'm not really sure the, the, uh, the relation. But the guy that was really instrumental in starting this school was John Miller Dickey. He was a Presbyterian minister. Like I said, there's always been a, a link between uh, spiritual organizations and the development of people. And here's another, here's another example. Uh, he did a lot of things, and I think I saw that he uh, said he took actions in a court, in a, uh, court proceeding where a young African-American girl was abducted by slave raiders. So a lot of times in those situations, uh, they would have to go to court to, to legally free her, but understand he was very instrumental in that. Now, the thing that sort of lit the fire in him was part of the Presbyterian ministry was designed to make other ministers. And even up north, it didn't matter what color that they were. So there's one black man, his name was John Amos, 
who he had taught personally to train him to become a minister. Well, a lot of times training actually required being accepted into a seminary, which is a school for preacher training, whatever you want to call it. Well, the biggest one at that time was, in, was at Princeton University. Well, obviously the guy was qualified, but for other reasons, they wouldn't let him in. And we know what those reasons were. So as a result, he went back to his group uh, of ministers and organization, and he pitched a plan to them in order to set aside monies to start schools for, and I quote, an institution for the scientific, classical, and theological education of colored youth of the male sex. So that word colored is part of our history. Deal with it. It'll be all right. Today, that school is known as Lincoln University, and I'll tell you a side story about that. Basically, what happened, a lot of times, like a lot of these schools that started before the Civil War, Civil War caused some of them to kind of close temporarily. Well, I'm not sure if this one, but the other one was. So this school was renamed for Abraham Lincoln, his participation in help freeing the slaves in the war. So, so Lincoln University is Ashman Institute. Finally, the fourth one, Wilf, Wilberforce University, which started in Xenia, Ohio. And this was very interesting. Um, the land on which this university was found was actually a resort. It started as a resort. Now, I told you a little while ago that at one point in time, the South Mississippi Valley Delta had more millionaires than you could find anywhere. Okay, we know how they got their money. Well, when you're rich, you go on vacation. You go to resorts. You balling. You're doing things. Well, they would go to this resort up north. The only problem, they bring their slaves with them. So that's not a problem if they were in the South, but because of the environment where in the North slavery was against the law, folks had a problem with that. So through economic sanctions and things of that nature, they actually forced the resort to go out of business. And at that point, the Methodist church bought this piece of land for about $13,000 with the explicit purpose of creating a school. Now, I'll fast forward this a little bit. Now, the school actually, once again, closed because of the Civil War. However, after the Civil War, the African Methodist Episcopal Church bought this property and continued on with the school. So if you look at the history of this school, you'll see the Methodist Church, but, but if you kind of look at some of the school website, they'll claim that the African, African Methodist Episcopal Church was actually the founder of this university and it's retained its name today. I'm getting tired. We already know, or it should be any secret to you, that there is a wealth gap in the United States. Y'all know what I mean when I say wealth gap? Okay. If HBCUs were not started, then the wealth gap as we know it today would be even wider. So let's get that understood first and foremost. We may not have everything we had, but the, the gulf would be even bigger, okay? Statistics for you, and I'm glad Sister Hall had, uh, had, had, had brought this up. So 80% of your black federal judges, 75% of your black PhDs, and we got two up in here that I know of, 85% of your black doctors, 50% of your black engineers, all have ties to HBCUs. In Texas, state we're in right now, the economic impact, $1.3 billion, generate about 11,000 jobs, and accumulate of $11.4 billion in total lifetime earnings. Now, those earnings are not just one or two people, that's over a bunch of people. So even in, at home, the economic impact of HBCUs is really, 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 really important. And it's important for us to continue to support them. Now, the four letters, HBCU, that may mean a lot of things to you. We're characterized by the step shows. Everybody knows the Battle of the Bands. 
That's from the outside looking in. But I want to suggest to you that whenever you see those four letters, HBCUs, I want to entertain that you think of one other thing. It represents how we as blacks My uh, college is Tuskegee University. It is located in Tuskegee, Alabama, founded in 1881 in a one-room shanty. 30 adults represent the first class where Booker T. Washington was the first teacher. Near between 1941 and 1946, nearly 1,000 African-American aviators known as the Tuskegee Airmen completed the flight force at Tuskegee University. The three celebrities that went there were Congressman Al Green, Richie <coughs> Smiley, and Lionel Richie. Kimani, and I'll be talking about Lane College. Lane College was established on November 12, 1882 by Bishop Isaac Lane. Three facts about Lane College are it offers, associ it offers associates with bachelor and bachelor degrees in arts and science. It was found by the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and located in Jackson, Tennessee. Two famous people who went there were Ricky 
me. Rico Chapel, he was, he went and graduated from Lane College and is now a di designer, a fashion designer. And Jacoby Jones went and graduated from Lane College and came to Texas to play in the NFL and retired in 2016. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you the real story here now. Oh. <laughs> All right. I am at Grambling State University. Yeah. It was established in 1901 as the colored and normal school then in Boyle in 1946. School became Grambling College, named after P.G. Grambling, a white sawmill owner who donated a large part of the land where the school is located today. The school is sits on 590 acres of land in Grambling, Louisiana. I said, without some white, some good white folks having us, we would we still be in the Mississippi. Mm. This man donated. Tiger Band performed in the first ever Super Bowl halftime show in 1967. Just think about it. They invited to one of the best shows ever at the Super Bowl. If you're going to the Super Bowl and Ruben and I have gone to about 13, that, that is something to see. I know y'all see it on TV a lot of times, but for them to be it's one of one of the best shows that ever that by performing halftime. They not only went to six, uh, the first one, they went to the seventh one, they went, then they went to four more. They went to six Super Bowls when they performed. Grammy State University was doing it. Was doing it. Okay? Grammy State University placed 211 players in the National Football League more than any other HBCU. Longtime Grammy head coach Eddie Robinson is number five on the list of the 150 greatest coaches in college football history. He was head coach for 56 years. Grammy Tiger, Doug Williams, if anybody saw the Super Bowl 22, Doug Williams was the first black quarterback that won and played in the Super Bowl and was watching the Redskins. The first, the later you saw two black quarterbacks, but before, before um, Doug Williams, there was no black quarterback. He was pretty, pretty good. Now, you see the logo, the, the logo up here. <laughs> the Green Bay Packers has a lot to do with that. They authorized uh, Grammy State University to use that to attribute to one of their graduates of Grammy State University defensive end, Willie Davis, because he played for the Green Bay Packers. That's an honor in itself. Yeah. When you see that big G up there, that's what you see there, uh, from Green Bay Packers, and they authorized. I said you were all candidate. As a young man growing up, only thing I heard about, him, and I wanted to go to Grammy State, but that's the only thing I heard about, Grammy State University. And so I, I salute them and all HBCUs. I am Southern University. I was established by the state legislators in 1880 to serve as an institution for higher learning for persons of color. Classes began in 1881. An average of 8,000 students are enrolled at the Baton Rouge campus. I am seventh in population from a study done in 2021 among the other HBCUs. And I'm home to a variety of academic programs that award bachelors, masters, and doctorate. Per a U.S.
Press News article in 2022, I am tied with the 26th place in the nation among the, 79 of, among the study of the 79 HBCUs. The Human Jukebox is a 230 member ensemble and it's known as one of the best college marching bands in the United States. My sports teams are known as the Jaguars and a very important graduate named Matthew Douglas Scott. He was a pitcher for the Southern University baseball team from 2002 to 2007. <laughs>
Since that time, we have not had to look back at anyone. If you talk about education for black Americans and Hispanic Americans, you talk about number one in the nation. Number one in the nation. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about a pharmacy school where 94% of the people who take the state test pass the first time, we're talking about Texas Southern University in the heart of Houston, two to three to five miles from downtown Houston, next to CUNY Home, where you have a built-in research uh, population for almost any research that you want to do on mankind. <coughs> Texas Southern University has been accredited as one of the research universities in America. Name dropping. No, most of you don't get up early enough <laughs> to look at Mr. Strahan. Or Strahan, if you say it American like. <laughs> big space in his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Texas Southern University. <coughs> who, uh, Michael Strahan, by right now you all know who I'm talking about. Good morning, America. And then you can see, yeah, Texas Southern University. If you would go back to 19. When Samuel Matrix was president from 1955 to 1966, he was a leading person in science and science. He was an advisor to Dwight the Eisenhower. When Lyndon B. Johnson became president, he took Samuel Matrix.
So Houston Tillerson University derives from the merger of Tillerson College and Samuel Houston College. Uh, Tillerson College dates back to 1875 and the work of the Freedmen Aid Society uh, of the American Missionary Association of the Congregational Church, now known as the United Church of Christ. The Methodist West Texas Conference agreed in 1877 to re relocate the school to Austin, Texas. From 1944 to 1945, future baseball legend Jackie Robinson accepted an offer to be the athletic director of Samuel Houston College, then of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. On October 24th, 1952, Tillerson College and Samuel Houston College merged to form Houston Tillerson College. Houston Tillerson College officially changed its name to Houston Tillerson University on February 28th, 2005. was originally we'll get this was originally founded as a uh, connection high school an institute for education of uh, Negro youth by a small group of African Americans and we have touched on that purpose of the college to do the location of high school youth. Um, the original purpose was to uh, educate free slaves and their offspring. Um, and originally classes were held in churches and in teachers' homes. 1877, uh, the school moved to Austin, Texas, uh, from Austin to Waco, and then it was renamed Waco College. Um, it's how 
Oh, that's not picking up. Notable, are you good now? Uh, notable alumni, Dick Campbell, uh, who was a key feature in the black theater during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he was also a producer uh, who helped launch the career of the late Ozzie Davis. Andy Lefty Cooper, uh, a Negro League pitcher who was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006. Tony Rose, a Democratic member of the Texas House of Representatives, and uh, she has uh, represented uh, her district uh, since uh, 2013. We Me Farm. I'm going to explain what that means. The We Me, the We Over Me Farm, uh, formerly called the Food for Good Farm, uh, was founded in March 2010, uh, fighting to end food insecurity and injustice in the U.S. The program was created through a partnership with PepsiCo to bring healthy food to the food desert of Dallas. They actually called it a desert, so that was interesting. They were going without. Paul Quinn decided to convert uh, his football field into an organic farm to facilitate this effort. Uh, it is a federally recognized food desert. Uh, the farm has produced and provided more than 30,000 pounds of organic pr pr produce since its inception. The farm strives to improve communities throughout the Metroplex uh, by providing hands-on educational experience for youth and adults alike. To promote, to promote healthy eating, mm -hmm. improved food access, and environmental stewardship. That's Paul Quinn. Hello, I'm Susie Ifa. I am representing Prairie View AMM University. Welcome to the Hill. <laughs> So I'm the first state-supported college in Texas for African Americans, and I was established during the re, uh, Reconstruction period after the Civil War in 1876. Um, I have specializations in careers such as business, architecture, agriculture, and um, human sciences, education, arts and sciences, um, engineering, and nursing. I was ranked number one uh, during 2019 through 2020 for uh, my online MBA program in Texas, um, also the highest starting salaries, and also producing um, undergraduate and graduate um, African-American architects. Um, my motto is Prairie View produces productive people. <laughs> <laughs> I have a radio station, KPVU, tune in to um, channel 91.3. Who you rooting for? That, that one. Hello, my name is Jarrell Como. Uh, as was said, I will be talking about HBCUs and music and their musical impact. Um, I myself did not go to an HBCU, but as a black performer, I've always looked up to black performers, ensembles. I'm always looking for black composers so that we may be able to spread their songs and our music of our people. Um, so HBCUs played an important role in training and nurturing black music and artists. For more than 150 years, musicians produced by HBCUs have been globally renowned. I'm talking about choirs, bands, composers, and opera singers. Um, but before I introduce them, I'm going to talk about, oh, 
for that FICO. <laughs> it's in the back. I switched it, but didn't switch with me. Uh, how were HBCU music programs established? So there's a difference between music programs, which is offered by the university, but then also musical ensembles. So obviously music programs were offered by the university. That's where people would go to be trained in an instrument, voice, or composition, or music marketing. But then there's also musical groups, which were established by the students of those universities. And they've also had important impacts when it comes to HBCU and the spreading of African music. Have to go all the way back, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I forgot. So we're in the Jim Crow era, era, and this time people of color are not able to access you know, uh, music or concert halls in that respect because they weren't allowed there. You know, try to walk in, get kicked out, or say you're not allowed to be here. So one of the things that HBCUs did is that they opened up universities to train people of color in music, but also to offer those concerts or musical experience or opportunities that other places that they would been that would have been inaccessible otherwise. Um, sorry. And then as far as musical, going back to what I was saying about musical groups that like were, that came together in HBCUs, um, a lot of those musical groups were very important because during this time, black universities, as you would, you would guess, probably weren't as well funded. So a lot of those musical groups would come together in order to travel, fundraise, get, those mo get money for the university in order for the university to thrive and those things to continue to flourish. And one of those groups, the first group we're gonna talk about is the Fisk Jubilee Singers, which came together for that exact reason. Fisk University was not doing well financially. So a group called the Fisk Jubilee Singers, they came together. Sorry, I'm trying to get, it's not the same on my, as it is up here. The Fisk Jubilee Singers were a group of people that came together and they, were, they would travel, sing songs. Now, not just any songs. Like we hear about spirituals or like gospel or blues and jazz. No, they were singing original slave songs that you would hear on the plantation. There was no accompaniment behind it, no piano, no anything, all voices, chant style. The beautiful slave songs that you would hear on the plantations. And now they didn't just do this like within the realm of that state. They would travel around. They were an international group. They went to Europe. They went, they were traveled all over America. They went to Europe. They would perform at athletic events. They would perform at military events. Uh, and then of course they would perform on their campuses. Um, but this is really important because when you think about the history of music in general across the nation, a lot of it is influenced by African-American styles. A lot of music around the world is influenced by African-American styles. And they are one of the reasons why a lot, of a lot of different nations have the type of genres and music that they have today because they were influencing those things. They would hear our music and be like, oh, that's neat. I'm going to put it in this. <laughs> so, so you see, the Fifth Jubilee Singers were very influential and came out of Fitz University, which influenced music nationwide. Uh, I put in some clips. They're like short ones, but I don't know if they're gonna play. I think you have to hit play on the slide if you do that. I did like 30 minutes. I'm not 30 minutes, 30 seconds, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hit play on this on the slide? See if it works. It didn't. If not, we can move on.
It's okay. We can move on. We don't have to play it. <laughs> I, I wanted you to hear it, but uh, we don't have to go. Um, our next person that we're going to talk about, her name is Lil Hardin Armstrong. Now, raise your hand if you know who Lil Hardin Armstrong is. Okay. So Lil Hardin Armstrong is the wife of Louis Armstrong, the famous uh, cornet, trumpetist. Um, but she's really cool. So she went to, she also went to Fisk University. Now, I will do a caveat. She did not graduate <laughs> from Fisk University, but she did go there, and a lot of her musical training is from Fisk University. She went there for a bit, and then she got involved with uh, Joe King Oliver, his band, and then later on went to push Louis Armstrong to, and tell him, hey, you're good enough to be on your own, where he went on to be a soloist and started his own band. Um, she was a accompanist, pianist, she was a band leader, and she was also a soloist. Um, she cut several records of large companies such as Decca Records and Riverside Records, and she composed a, normal, uh, a number of original songs that were played by both King Joe, Joe King Oliver's and Louis Armstrong's band. One of them was Just For a Thrill, Strutting With Some Barbecue, uh, Perdido Street Blues, and I'm Not Rough Enough, or I'm Not Rough. Um, and her musical legacy was about 50 years long, mm -hmm. which is really cool. And the biggest band, so this was during the time of like early jazz when, um, when Chicago was a big jazz festival after everyone migrated from Louisiana to Chicago. Because we have no records of jazz in Louisiana, we only have records of jazz in Chicago. And she was a big influencer, a composer, and she got Basically, there would be no Louis Armstrong without her. <laughs> um, but it was because of her musical talent and her musical knowledge that she was able to push people, compose songs, to be able to do these big things. And she got all of that from Fisk University. Next, we're going to go to Wilberforce University. And I think it's called, no, I think they're different. Central State University of Wilberforce. But from Wilberforce University, we have William Grant still. Now, I learned about him in college. I had no clue about him, but he was a composer uh, that came, that was trained at Wilberforce University. He composed over 200 works, five symphonies, four ballets, nine operas, and then over 30 choral works, art songs, chamber music, and works for solo instrument. And one of his biggest uh, compositions that he wrote was called the Afro-American uh, or the Afro-American Symphony, uh, which composes elements of jazz, blues, um, and it demonstrates how blues can be raised to the highest musical rank, as it often considered to be a music of the lower class, which was really cool. And this piece has gone to influence other composers in adding jazz and blues into their compositions, even though jazz and blues before was considered black music and people didn't want to put that in classical styles because it was considered low class. Mm. And then our last person that I'm going to talk about is Jesse Norman. Mm. Now Jesse Norman is a big influence on me. She is a opera singer. She is known for her amazing colorful voice, her extreme range. She can sing the highs and the lows. <laughs> um, but she's also a four-time Grammy winning a uh, Grammy Award winning singer um, and she's performed all over the world in New York, Berlin, Spain, Holland, Germany, Scotland, England, etc. And she graduated from Howard University. Um, and she was also a humanita humanitarian. She during the segregated area she was sit she was doing sit-ins, you know, bringing people in and doing the work that our people were doing. Um, well, all this to say, our, uh, and then we have our bands. Now, I know FMU was already, what is going on with these slides? Mm -hmm. I know FMU was already uh, talked about, but I'm gonna talk about it a little more with the Marching 100. Um, so before, obviously they're a band at uh, FAMU, um, but before, HBU bands took on military band marching style combined with 
uh, popular in the music with like circus, circus bands and minstrel show, minstrel show music. So, so this was like, we don't do this anymore. <laughs> um, but that was what was happening before. It was like, it was okay. Eh, it was okay. <laughs> Not very entertaining. But after World War II, under the direction of Dr. William P. Foster, uh, began the F the FAMU band, the Marching 100, began to perform popular music combined with energetic choreography, which would be seen, which would be seen and adopted by HBCUs all over the nation, and as Sister Rashir said, all over the world. Like, they started it. They were the pioneer for it, and because of them, other people, other HBCUs adopted it, and then every other university adopted it. But it didn't just stop there, it also trickled down because then you had people from HBCUs that adopted this style that became educators. They would go down to the middle school and high school level and then this became the norm for high school bands and middle school bands for both uh, colored schools and white schools and even now today, it's a big influence. Like they changed the game, like for real, for real. <laughs> um, they were performed at campus events uh, community celebrations, religious services, military drills, um, and like I said, they changed band education, which is kind of crazy to think about, that one school can change a whole nation of band education. Um, and then, so what impact did HBCUs have on cultivating such spreading black American music? So we're talking about tradition, traditional African sound techniques. So HBCUs, music programs or musical groups were well versed in both traditional sounds of African music and dialect and could hold true to the authenticity uh, and purity. So no, like other schools and colleges outside of HBCUs, they didn't hold on to that tradition because it wasn't a part of their tradition what African music real, uh, sounded like, what slave music really sounded like. And because that we held on to the, those traditions, that HBCUs held on to those traditions, that they can incorporate it into other musical genres in both popular music and classical styles. Um, outreach, uh, HBCUs were used as musical entertainment sources and provided younger children with music lessons to jumpstart their music education because younger children weren't getting that music education. Because classical music was considered higher, was considered for white people, it wasn't considered for black people. So HBCUs were educating black students at a young level so that when they got to those higher levels, they were on the same playing field, if not better. Uh, travel and fundraising. As I said earlier, a lot of musical groups at HBCU, starting with Fisk University, they set the mold. Um, but a lot of HBCU musical groups, they had to travel around and sing our songs or play uh, songs in the style of, Af in style of African style um, to raise money for their universities in order for them to succeed. And because of this traveling around and playing this music that our sound was adopted in a lot of musical genres. We talk about jazz, blues, uh, spirituals, Ragtime, gospel, even it's in pop, hip hop, rock is influenced by <laughs> by African American styles. Um, it's just it's our HBCUs really helped to spread through musical programs and musical groups our sound, which encompasses a lot of international musical uh, musical genres, including classical music, um, and then just popularizing it. Our sound sound the best, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's because of that, that it's been incorporated in so many musical genres. Uh, and then lastly, um, this question was proposed, when were HBCU musical programs at their most influential? I believe during the Jim Crow era, after the Civil War, just because things weren't, as, weren't accessible to people of color, especially music. So we didn't have, we weren't able to just go places and hear good music. We weren't able to do that. So the fact that HBCUs during the Jim Crow era opened their doors for training, opened their doors for performances, and allowed 
people of color to be able to see those things and be influenced by those things and train under those things, it gave us another leg up in order for us to be able to spread our culture and um, influence others with our music. And it just kept our tradition alive. So, that's it. Thank you. everyone enjoyed our black history program um, really appreciate everyone who came really appreciate everyone who was a part of it now um, brother Scott wanted to make sure that you all were paying attention so he provided a, a few prizes so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions if you want to get yourself a prize raise your hand we'll see if you got the right answer does that make sense <laughs> all right so how many HBCUs are in the United States sister Hannah no. Sister Blair? 107. So I'll come to you with this after. <laughs> Next question. How many HBCUs are in Texas? I saw Ryan's hand. Nine. You get yourself a prize, too. Next question. What genre of music did the Fist Jubilee singers perform internationally? Okay, Uncle Frank. <laughs> That's right, the slave songs, well done. All right, let's see, one more question. What was the original name of Cheney University? Close enough, Institute for Colored Youth. All right, so well done. Thank you all for joining us um, in that. Again, if you remind me, I'm gonna come by, you can pick out your gift. Um, now we are going to have our closing prayer by Brother James Hall. the hearts of some evil people, how you touch the hearts of legislators, how you just touch the hearts of people to make it possible for free slaves, people of low income, to be able to go to college. You know, Heavenly Father, we hope and pray that those of us of color will never forget or down or be delivered the fact that HBCUs are there and always be as supportive as possible. We ask that you give us safe conduct to our homes or wherever we might go. Thank you again for this day that you have provided us with. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>